Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Talking. Zach, Zach just hit the record button. So, uh, Professor Guy, if you don't mind, for the people that haven't heard of you, um, let me let me just I'm gonna I'm gonna do this because I don't know if you're gonna do this. So I looked you, I looked you up and if you look at, look at your your profile, you're in the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. Uh, you are one of the most cited researchers of all time. I saw that you were like you've been cited something like two hundred thousand times. Um, you you know when we talk about evidence as a physician, I've been you know, we've been hearing evidence based medicine and you know we got to practice evidence based medicine. I can't remember when I started it started becoming into my, into my uh, sort of space, but it was at least 10, 15 years ago, people were talking about evidence-based medicine. When I look at that, it, it, it turns out that there's this guy called, named Professor Gordon Guy, who actually coined that term back in the 1990s or 1991 and was instrumental in actually developing evidence-based medicine as we know it now, and I think that's significant. So if you don't mind, can you give us a brief introduction of, of, of who you are real quick? Okay, so I'm a distinguished professor at McMaster University, and as you uh, just pointed out um, around 1990, we got the notion of what is now evidence-based medicine. <clears throat> and one of the challenges was what to call it. And I, I am the person who came up with the term evidence-based medicine. And in the subsequent uh, 30 years or so, uh, I have been an advocate, worldwide advocate, for uses uh, for people to use evidence-based approaches uh, to achieve the optimal management of their patient care. So prior to 1990, and you know, this was, I think I'm trying to remember where I was back in 1990. I think I was still, I just gotten out of college and I was out there. I think I was getting my head kicked around on the rugby pitch, but <laughs> when, um, so prior to that, what was the emphasis that drove you towards say, hey, we need evidence-based medicine or we need that concept? What was going on prior to that? Well, although lay people find it extraordinary, prior to 1990, clinicians had essentially no training in reading primary literature, systematic reviews. Systematic reviews actually were just starting in 1990. They weren't around um, and um, uh, and structured guidelines the way they are uh, they are now weren't around either but if you just go to primary studies clinicians had no training whatsoever really zero in how to read a primary study and gain any insights into it so where ebm got started was to say hey wait a minute this seems there seems something wrong that clinicians are given no training whatsoever in reading the literature and as a result, um, uh, they, uh, they cannot use the primary literature. They just need to be told what to do without any reference back to the evidence. And in fact, the people that were telling them what to do, that is the experts, weren't trained to read the primary evidence either. Mm -hmm. And so you were taking people who don't know how to read the primary evidence, advising people who have not even been have not have not given any training whatsoever. So this was uh, we thought this was highly problematic. And so as you came up with you know as you started to sort of piece together, well, how do we sort it? Because there's 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 so many studies. I mean there are, I mean just in nutrition alone, there's a million studies or something like that, and there's they're all over the place, and much of it is observational epidemiologic studies, and there's and, and there's a smaller percentage of actual intervention trials, and, then, and a smaller percentage of them are even worth you know, that showing endpoints that actually matter. How do we pick through all that data? How do we and, and talk about the development of the grade system and any other systems that you found that are that are effective at, at, at picking through? Okay, that? so um, uh, by two thousand. Um, 
the clinicians were relying more and more on structured clinical practice guidelines. And in fact, major organizations, all of like uh, orthopedic organizations and cardiovascular organizations and thoracic, had, had decided that uh, their mission should include producing practice guidelines. Um, and they, by that time, they began to get the idea that saying, is the quality of evidence high or low? So, can you edit this thing? Uh, chance, quiet. <laughs> it's, okay. it's not the first or last dog bark that we've had in our podcast. Okay, okay. <laughs> chance, quiet. Okay. Sorry. A dog, a dog wants, he wants to put his input in. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Just a second, I'm going to have to get up. <laughs> That's okay. Chance. I thought it was your dog for a second, uh, Zach. And so, yeah, I, th I thought it was yours too. No, mine, I, mine are asleep still. I was, I was up at 5 a.m. doing a, a thing with the Philippines. And so, yeah. you know, it's so, so anyway, there's. Okay, still... sorry about that. No worries at all. You must have so, a young dog if it's up this early. Sean and I were just talking. I'm, my dog is so old, she doesn't get up before like 10 these days. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this one, two, two and a half. Anyway. Uh, so uh, the so there were so people decided rightly so that it was a good idea to tell the audience of their guideline whether the evidence was high quality trustworthy or chance or low quality very untrustworthy okay and they also had decided that it be, might be a good idea to tell people whether that these were strong recommendations that clear everybody should follow or weaker recommendations that might be right for some people and not for others. But there were literally dozens of systems around. Each of these organizations thought we should come up with our own, uh, with our own way of doing this. And this was, of course, very confusing and most of them weren't particularly well thought out. So a group of us got together and said, uh, perhaps if we could come up with a really well thought out approach to rating the quality of the evidence and moving from evidence to recommendations, this could be perhaps widely adopted. And it, it, if it was a good quality system, it would raise the quality across guidelines of what was done and it would be much more uniform so people wouldn't get confused by one, one uh, if they're looking, if I, I'm an in internal medicine, um, I might look at a cardiology guideline and a respirology guideline and a gastroenterology guideline. If they're all using different systems, I'm completely lost. And so we got together a group of guideline developers and uh, people who do systematic reviews uh, and methodologists in general, and we worked to come up with a system. And we started meeting in 2000, in 2004, we published the first publication of the system it was in the BMJ. Subsequently, the BMJ published a six part series about the, the approach, which we call GRADE. And uh, that was for clinicians who were, use, who were seeing the output of GRADE um, and uh, to get them understand what GRADE was doing. And then subsequently in 2000, we started a series in the Journal of Clinical, Clinical Epidemiology, which has now gone to 22 articles and it's going to keep going. Um, and that is for the people who are making the grade ratings. So that's for systematic review authors and health technology assessment authors and guideline developers. And we have been quite gratified that over 110 organizations worldwide have picked up grade and it is now, and these organizations include major American organizations such as the American Thoracic Society or the American College of Physicians. Um, I'm actually not sure if any orthopedic organizations have picked it up, um, but rheumatology, uh, uh, rheumatologists have, um, and the Cochrane Collaboration is using it, and the World Health Organization is using it, and what might be most important for a lot of people up to date is using it um, so that uh, it, extremely wide uptake and use. And I think it's because we've more or less got it right. Dr. Guy, with the grade system, kind of with, with, that, with that procedure, is it pretty well established? And you kind of talked about it a little bit, I guess, that 
uh, you know, across the, the field of health and wellness, that that is kind of the gold standard in terms of. Yeah, well, as I stuff. say, over 110 organizations, mm -hmm. um, including all these prestigious, uh, prestigious groups. And when we write about it now and talk about it as the widely accepted standard, nobody comes back to us and said, wait a minute here, it's not. Sure. It is. So do you think then like with that level of support, is it just kind of, cause I mean, when I look at, and I'm obviously not a doctor or anything like that, but when I look at just kind of health and wellness and the way like it kind of gets pushed out to the public, um, it seems like a lot of times, you know, people who are just trying to pay attention to, there's just a lot of noise. They're hearing one thing is good and one thing is bad. And then they're hearing the exact opposite thing the next day. Is this a situation where like, if we can just educate the general public about the grade system and get them kind of up to speed as to using that as their compass, that we'd be much better off in kind of finding out what, what actually is like the ideal situation for the majority of people? Um, yes. So that the, um, uh, so that a standard of when they're, uh, <clears throat> if they even got the basic idea that a standard of what they're hearing is, what is the grade rating of quality of evidence? If that was something that they could expect, and if there isn't a grade rating of quality of evidence, they could, would be skeptical, that would be very positive, I think. Professor Guide, so um, some of the criticism, because you know you guys recently published this, this uh, study using the, the Nutrix Consortium, which I believe you're the chair of, published a, a controversial uh, series of six studies saying that, hey, maybe we don't need to cut back on red meat because it doesn't really, the evidence doesn't really show, or it's not very convincing that, that it, that's causing cancer, died, or heart disease, or really any other diseases. But one of the, one of the uh, concerns was they were saying, well, great is not appropriate for nutrition studies. It's only designed to sort out drug trials and so on and so forth. What, do, what is your response to the, the criticisms of, of that nature? Right. Well, um, i start with, I should correct, a guy named Brad Johnston, who at one time was working as a postdoctor, a fellow with me, uh, and is now a faculty member in Halifax, is the leader of Nutrix, but I'm very involved in uh, continuing to support Brad in his work. Um, so there is a term called epistemology, and epistemology is how we know things, how we differentiate opinion from what our trustworthy knowledge about how the world really works. And the issue here is a question, it's fundamentally a question of epistemology. How do we know things? <clears throat> now, what, um, to highlight my answer to that, I pick the following situation. You have two bodies of evidence based on observational studies that as far as you can tell are very similar. Same number of studies, same number of patients, same quality of the, or same risk of bias in the, in the individual studies. Everything you can think of is same magnitudes of effect. Everything you can think of that would judge the trustworthiness of those two bodies of evidence is identical. In one of the two bodies of evidence, say drugs, it is relatively easy to do randomized trials, and in the future one would hope to, that they would be done. In the other, say a nutritional intervention, it is difficult, if not impossible, to get randomized trial evidence because it's difficult for people to stick to the diets you assign them, and it's difficult to follow them for 20 years, which is the time that you would expect for the outcomes. So the two bodies of evidence are completely identical, but in one you could do randomized trials and in another you could not. And the question is, in these two identical bodies of evidence, does their trustworthiness differ because you could or could not get better evidence subsequently? we would argue that two bodies of evidence are identical. They have the same trustworthiness, irrespective of whether you can get better evidence later or whether you cannot. And it seems to us fundamentally illogical to say, we're going to judge the trustworthiness of these two identical bodies of evidence, not from something that's intrinsic to those bodies of evidence themselves, but what might happen in the future as to whether we get better evidence or not. 
And that is the, uh, that is the underlying disagreement. So we say two bodies of evidence, they're identical. They give us a identical information as far as trustworthiness. And the alternative appears to be the case. I've never had this um, face-to-face debate with the people who make this claim, but they say, no, apparently the evidence becomes more trustworthy when you can't do randomized trials subsequently. That makes no sense to us. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, I, I, I liken it to say that, uh, you know, you're about to board a plane and the plane has a broken wing and, and the landing gear doesn't work and the pilot's drunk. And you're going to say, well, that's the best we could afford. Sorry, that's what you get. And, that, and, and I, when, I, when I look at that, I, and I understand that the challenge of doing these nutritional studies, because it's really hard to, to, to double blind a part- participant for what they're eating. It's, it's pretty hard to convince me that I'm not eating one food when I'm eating another. And so the studies are very challenging to do. And, and, and so many of the proponents say, well, it's the best we have. Let's just make assumptions on that. And so, well, it, 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 so it, it's a lovely metaphor. Thank you. I'll, I'll keep it in mind. But it's what you're saying is, well, the wing might be broken and the pilot might be drunk. But, but that is actually good standards, right? It's not only it's the best we can afford, but we're saying this is quite a satisfactory standard, right? So it, they're right, it's the best they can afford, but it's not a satisfactory standard. Let me ask you, um, because you mentioned World Health Organization and they have adopted a grade as, as agreeing with it as, as a valid research tool or a valid tool to, to, to uh, determine how the evidence is for systemic re- systematic reviews. And yet in 2015, IARC, who is a World Health Organization, mem- I guess, component, re- did not use GRADE when they came up and said that red meat is a class, you know, two carcinogen and process was class one. What, what, why did they not decide to use GRADE? Do we have any insight on why they chose not to use that in that instance? And what is your, um, only, what is your concern? Only, only limited um, that the... Uh, I have some sympathy. Um, it's a, the people who work in a particular field to recognize that you're never going to be able to have high quality evidence and make strong statements is painful. If I were in the field, I'd find it painful. But sorry, folks, you got to face the music. Um, and uh, so um, uh, they, they are reluctant because understandably reluctant because it will mean that they have to face the fact that they're not going to have high quality evidence and they can't go out and make unequivocal statements like this. And because it's painful, they avoid it. If, um, and so you guys, re, you know, re-examine the same data and, and you didn't come up with any new numbers. I mean, basically no. it's like, yeah, I mean, we got low relative risk numbers, but we, you know, when I look at something and it's, so one of the criticisms people said, well, you know, we don't have data on smoking. We don't have good randomized double okay. control styles on so, smoking and so, therefore we need to throw out that data as well. What is the difference between the quality of evidence uh, saying smoking causes cancer right, and okay. meat doesn't ca- cause cancer? Right, okay. So there are circumstances when we can have um, high quality evidence despite randomized trials. So for instance, I'll come to smoking in a second, but as an orthopedic surgeon, you know there's never been any randomized trials of hip replacement. Um, And there never should have been any trials of hip replacement. Why not? Because the effect is so gigantic that there is no doubt that we get large, that patients get large benefits. And we have other examples from medical care like insulin for diabetic ketoacidosis, dialysis for renal failure, uh, intubating somebody who's about to expire from respiratory failure. We have these, we have a small number of interventions with these large effects where randomized trials would not only are unnecessary, but would be inappropriate. So there are situations. The difference between uh, smoking and uh, the red meat, for instance, is that the heavy smokers um, and non-smokers in terms of lung cancer, there is a tenfold gradient. So if you had, say, a 2% risk 
as a non-smoker, you would have a 20% risk as a smoker. With respect to red meat, if you have a 2% risk without red meat, you have a 2.3% risk with red meat. So with smoking, you just have this enormous effect that establishes causation essentially, whereas with red meat, the effect is tiny. So the effect, uh, 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 the effect of smoking versus the effect of red meat is approximately 30 times as great. Is there ever any relevance to something called the Bradford Hill criteria in, in some of this stuff? Because I know he, he in the 60s, uh, that was touched upon. Do you find any, any benefit to using his criteria or is there, are there major flaws with, with his thinking? Uh, um, essentially, um, you know, science evolves over time. Um, grade uses, the grade is consistent with the Bradford Hill criteria. It has a number of improvements from the Bradford Hill criteria, but is essentially consistent with the Bradford Hill criteria. So the, Brad, the Bradford Hill criteria um, uh, established very large effects as a reason to believe things. And another thing that gives us confidence in smoking is another of Bradford Hill's criteria, which is dose response. So the more you smoke, the more, uh, the bigger your risk goes up. That's another thing that supports smoking. And so Grade has said, uh, observation, uh, observational studies sometimes can give us moderate or high quality evidence. And I said a number of examples of that. And um, the criteria that you will rate up so that observational studies give high quality evidence include a very large effect in a dose response gradient which Bradford Hill identified way back as, as causation criteria. When you look at, and, and we, we are just inundated, it seems like every, every few days there's some new epidemiologic associational data. There's one that just came out on, on high protein diets and, and kidney function that was, I saw in my Medscape feed and I look at it and it's, 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 it's just, you know, guys with higher protein, their, their, their relative risk was 1.2% or, you know, something like that. Or one, you know, 1.2, 20%. How do you look at those studies and, 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 and evaluate if this is a valid conclusion or not based on, when do the numbers get compelling to you? Well, um, the, so we're now talking about observational studies and when observational studies might yield moderate or high quality evidence. And what we say is if the relative risk is more than two, which or less than 0.5, that's the equivalent, then you might consider rating up the quality of the evidence from low to moderate. If it's greater than five, less than 0.2, you might consider rating it up two levels to high quality evidence. So those are the, in terms of magnitude effect, we say very big effects we would rate up. Those are the sort of standards of magnitude of effect that we suggest. How do we, uh, you know, I, I don't know, if, are you familiar with, uh, out of Stanford, Professor John Anittis? I, I may be on. Oh, yes, I'm very familiar with John Anittis. So he has came out, and, and in fact, I, I just published a book recently, and I quoted him in saying that, you know, basically the nutritional epidemiology that we've engaged in in the last, you know, several decades has really yielded almost nothing, and we need to step away from that and actually do studies that will actually test these, you know, postulates. Are you, are you sort of in agreement with what he says in, in that regard with, with, with the well, sort of the... statement? Um, but um, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the um, going along, when I indulge myself in public, um, I say the conclusions from the evidence thus far about uh, nutrition are, is if it tastes good, go for it. Um, and... Uh, uh, that unfortunately is not too far from the truth. The, the, another way to put it is we only have low quality evidence for almost everything, low or very low quality evidence for almost everything with respect to nutrition. Um, and the only thing from what you said is about what uh, Professor Unitas was saying, it implied that somehow we can do better. I'm not sure we, can do, we will ever do better because um, it, as you pointed out earlier, doing the randomized trials, um, uh, people, 
people don't stick to their diets, so we can't get a good gradient in terms of diet. And then we need to follow people for very long periods of time, and that is extremely difficult. Um, so I'm not sure that we're ever going to get much better evidence. We may be stuck with saying the best we'll ever do in nutrition is low quality evidence. Do you think then that with, with that being said, uh, you know, one thing we've talked about a lot of times on this podcast, and you have to be careful with this, and I can appreciate that, is that like, you know, your outcomes or results are what should be guiding your decisions when it comes to nutrition, because since we have that lower level of evidence, then you almost need to let the biomarkers and your body be the guide. So do you think with that, it's more of a question of people having some options available to them in terms of what we can agree to as a community as um, you know, generally human appropriate food choices and then working within those parameters and then like doing their due diligence and paying attention to kind of their health markers and things like that and letting that kind of guide their, their food choices versus saying, you know, here's a group of foods you can eat. Here's a group of foods you can't do it or you'll die. <laughs> um, well, the latter is clearly inappropriate. Personally, on, when, we, when all we have is low quality evidence, I don't think food guides are a great idea at all because we really don't, there is just such uncertainty. Why should we be telling people what to do? Um, and as we did, what we, so what we did with the red meat is to say, okay, um, there's low quality evidence. It's not, there's no evidence. There's low quality evidence. If red meat is in fact causal in terms of, uh, increasing cancer or heart disease, which it might be. We haven't established it is, but it might be. But even if it is, the effects are extremely small. And then you say, okay, if you were presenting that to people and they really understood it, what would, how would people react in terms of um, reducing their red meat? And we also then did a systematic review of values and preferences. There have been studies about how people feel about their red meat and reducing their red meat. And that those suggested that people are attached to their red meat and might, would be reluctant to reduce it unless there was a compelling reason to do so. And so our judgment in our guideline is, sure, there will be some people who are sufficiently worried about the, the health issues. They're not maybe that attached to their red meat and even a small and uncertain benefit of reducing, that would be worth it for them, but most people it wouldn't. So the issue is people should uh, understand the evidence and uh, make choices accordingly. So back to if it tastes good, go for it. Um, the, uh, you can tell people, well, there's some suggestion that X might be better than Y, um, but it's only low quality evidence and you have to see how you feel about eating and you can talk. And there are certainly, there are certainly many, many anecdotal situations where people try some diet and it feels better to them than another diet. Well, that's a good reason for doing it. I mean, you have the subjective impression that you feel better in one diet than another. Great. Um, but the decisions need to be made on an individual basis with an understanding that nobody is gonna tell you with any confidence that if you switch from this to this, you're gonna be healthier. All right, folks, this episode of Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a meat delivery company that brings you high quality beef, chicken, pork, salmon, and scallops. What does this mean? All products are natural and humanely raised or sustainably wild caught, as is the case with their salmon and scallops. If you are concerned with how the animals you eat were raised, rest assured, ButcherBox partners with farmers who are inspired by Dr. Temple Grandin, a member of the Humane Farm Animal Care Program's scientific committee. Their beef is 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, the chicken is organic and the pork is heritage breed with no added sugar. So head over to butcherbox.com and place an order today. And don't forget to enter promo code HPO for a discount. Thank you for supporting one of our longstanding sponsors. Now back to the show. 
Professor Guy, we have, you know, as you probably are aware in the U.S., every five years we come up with our dietary guidelines and they review the evidence and they say this is the diet that we think Americans or Canadians or whatever should eat. And, and, we, and what you're saying is we just don't really have good evidence to make those dietary guidelines. Should we even have dietary guidelines at this point based on what we have with evidence? Well, I said earlier, I don't think we should. I think it is. I think by nature they are fundamentally misleading. So I have, I have a couple questions for you. So when, when, if I were to say I want to take something to the bank and I were to say there's some outcome measure that I could measure and say, let, let's just say visceral body fat. Let's say that, you know, if, if I reduce my visceral body fat and I, and I lose that big belly of mine, is, that, is there enough evidence to say that that is a good thing? Can we, can we, can we make that statement, do you think? Um, the, the, so I am, so first of all, disclaimer, um, I do not know the details of the evidence uh, about that. I do know that there are no randomized trials of loss of, uh, of reduction of weight, um, uh, of reduction of weight that have shown benefits. Um, so first of all, we're very unlikely that there's high or even moderate quality evidence except if you're talking about extremes. So if you talk about morbid obesity versus, um, uh, versus op what some, what optimal body weight, then, there are, then you have these big effects, right? So observational studies will show people with morbid obesity. And again, I, I'm not talking out of um, having just reviewed these papers last week, uh, 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 I haven't done a careful look at it, but my impression is that for, for uh, moderate levels of obesity, we don't, uh, all we have is observation studies. We don't have randomized trials. So that for moderate levels of obesity, I think all we have is association and low quality evidence. For large, for morbid obesity, I think the effects are large. So I think you can tell people who are morbidly obese, if you get down to at least mildly obese or even moderately obese, um, you will do, your, your health will be better. So that we can say with confidence. What about if we have people that are currently on medications for disease and we are able to do some lifestyle modification and they come off those medications, would that indicate their, 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 their would that indicate success? Do you think there's evidence that would say that that is, that is a, Positive well, thing. You, you can say for sure that any medication you take has potential adverse effects um, and it has costs. So at the very least, when you come off any medication, um, you get to spend your money someplace other than the medication. Um, uh, and um, you uh, now are free of any si uh, the risk of side effects that might have emerged from the medication. So just on that basis, that seems to be unequivocal benefit. There, I mean, it seems, yeah, I hear, you know, there's, there's a lot of controversy in the world of nutrition and people, this diet is better than that diet. And they always like to point out that, you know, I think you're gonna get cancer in 20 years. I think you're gonna get, uh, you know, heart disease in 20 years. And, and my, I almost find that almost like a religious thing. There, there, it's really just so, I, I just don't think there's evidence that shows that you can, you can make that, uh, as, those assumptions. Are, is, am I incorrect in, in thinking that? Well, what we call it is low quality evidence. So there are some things that we can be confident about and some things we cannot be confident about. And these are some of the things we can, it may be, and there is some suggestion but it's not something we can be confident about. Moreover, even if it is true, the associations are so small that the effect, so for instance, um, what we showed is that if it were true, if these associations were causal, which we don't know they are, but they may be, that if you, for the rest of your life, cut three servings of meat out of your diet, you would reduce your risk of dying of cancer by seven in a thousand. And some people may say, oh, that sounds like not a trivial effect to me. Others, I think, might say that sounds like quite a trivial effect. So the bottom line is maybe it's true, but maybe it isn't.
and we're not sure which. And if it is true, the effects are small. So let me just kind of throw this scenario at you. So if, if I were to examine the, the effect of red meat, and, and I, I think one of the problems we have with nutrition is there are so many confounding factors, you know, and we get these relative risks. And it, it, could it be the exercise? Could it be the... Could it be the smoking, the drinking, the, the not wearing the seatbelt, the not eating this or that, not visiting your doctors? And we have, people will say, well, then we have multivariate analysis and we can, we can, we can sort of compensate for that. How do, we, how do we know how much the relative effect of each of those things, are we just guessing? Or, or do we have some really good ways to say that this, this, this confounding factor was completely accounted for and therefore the results are valid? Or are they really just kind of best guesses? Well, within a particular data set, you can look at the association between alcohol and outcomes, and you can do a statistical adjustment for that that should take care of that, except for the fact that you're relying on what people tell you about their alcohol consumption. And how accurate do you think that is, okay? And when people adjust for socioeconomic status, which is always a powerful determinant of outcome. A lot, a lot of times people don't like to tell you about their income, and even that may be limited. You don't ask them how much money have you inherited. Um, they use postal codes, and they say, well, there are postal codes where rich people live and postal codes that poor people live, but sometimes, but there's going to be a gradient in income. So they can adjust for socioeconomic status, but the measurement of socioeconomic status is limited. And similarly, you can just for exercise, and you can look at the association, and within your database, you will be able to adjust for the association, but it's an it's a association based on what people tell you. So, um, first of all, you were absolutely, you gave a very nice description of what's limited in the observational studies, which is essentially that you, you have an association, but it could be something else. So, if it's a red meat association, Maybe the people who eat less red meat also exercise more or there's something else in their diet that they do di differently that is quite possible or um, uh, they have different smoking habits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you try to adjust for those things, but all those adjustments, you can adjust for what's in the database, but what's in the database is dependent on the information you have about these prognostic factors and they're always going to be limited. Moreover, there may be something you haven't thought of or we don't know about yet that could be responsible for the association. And it is all those reasons why these modest associations give only low quality evidence. And it requires very large associations that are very unlikely to be explained by confounders before we can make confident inferences on the basis of observational studies. Let me let me ask you a little bit about bias because uh, I know we we've over the last I don't know decade or so we're starting to see authors declare financial bias. But one of the things you guys did in the recent study, the Nutrix study, was you talked about what you ate in your own personal in your own personal diet, and we see that there are um, you know studies coming out by authors that may personally prescribe to eat a certain way. There's people that are ethical vegans that publish vegan papers. Does that, does that sort of intellectual bias, can that impact the, the conclusions that are made on a study? Do you believe there's, there's something to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the um, people, um, as, uh, I think you said earlier um, that people uh, not infrequently take a religious, uh, uh, it's like these, uh, their uh, dietary beliefs is, they feel strongly about it as a religion. I believe in it. And uh, hopefully scientists won't, uh, won't operate in that way. But um, it's worthwhile. We, we thought it was worthwhile letting people know um, uh, because at least in theory, it could influence how you look at the data. I, love I, it, I, was, very, I was very glad I don't eat meat when I said meat's okay. <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, Zach. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you something that's a little you might find interesting. So, there's a group of people out there now, myself included, that eat a lot of meat. We eat, in fact, my diet for the last three years has been exclusively red meat. I eat something like 
two kilos of red meat every single day, right? And we are looking at this population and I've done surveys and they're not, they're not, you know, like I said, they're, they're, they're surveys, but we, what we're seeing is these people are getting leaner. Their inflammatory markers are getting better. Their, their triglyceride levels are dropping. Their blood glucose is stabilizing. They're coming off medications. They're saying they feel the best they ever have. I mean, this, you know, we've got this huge concentration gradient that we talk about. Can we get good evidence about red meat in people that only eat red meat over a period of time, and how do we how do we assess that? What what, what are your thoughts on on that that sort of crazy crazy well, scenario? The, the uh, uh, to make any associations, well, so the great approach starts saying you want to make inferences about anything. You need an explicit comparator. So you would need to say two kilograms of red meat a day versus what? What are you comparing to? And eating no red meat, one kilogram a day, et cetera. So the first thing is when you're making inferences, what is your comparison? So that's what, that's what I would start with. And then once you say I'm comparing two kilograms a day versus the ordinary diet, which is three servings a week, approximately across, uh, uh, across Western countries, um, uh, when you go to two kilograms a day relative to, um, uh, relative to three servings a week, you'd need to do the same thing in both groups. And um, so that would be, if you, if you haven't got a group comparison, you're going to be um, less certain. Now, again, you have, um, so, what, what you have described is what we would call a before-after study. Um, you had high inflammatory markers and, um, uh, and I don't know what else. Uh, I, I can't remember what else. Like, that struck me. And now you start eating all meat. And um, you may be able to say this really did affect your inflammatory markers if you have a very large reduction in inflammatory markers, that it would be different, that you couldn't explain by, I mean, I would just speculate. Somebody goes on this, I'm going to eat nothing but meat, I'm going to becoming one of these health fanatics who really believe in this. It is quite possible that at the same time, they start to exercise much more than they would have. I suspect that might ha happen in some people. Um, further, it may uh, just be that they, at the, at the same time, they say they, this is part of a, I'm revamping my life. I'm improving my relationships. I'm also doing Buddhist meditation while I'm doing it. And they become more peaceful individuals because of this other thing. And that may be the explanation of their lower inflammatory markers. But if the effect is huge, then it's unlike it's much it's uh, much less likely that these other things are in fact responsible. So uh, I think I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named David Ludwig out of Harvard. We're gonna he's gonna do a study on this. We're gonna look at this population, and you know it's gonna be what was going on before. You know what, what was your diet before? You know this is the intervention you've done it for six months. What are your results now? So that's 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 a start. I think in my view, when I look at red meat consumption, even in the US, and they say red meat is a cause of cancer, and I see that the average American eats 2.4 ounces of beef a day, which is a relatively small component of the diet. Um, it, 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 to me, it makes it's hard to get you know, a big association or make the leap that that's the cause of all the problems when you've got even so many other dietary confounders. And now, this group, it's, you know, the entire diet is meat, and so you can maybe at least make a dietary assumption about that, assuming those other things are intact. Let me ask you about this. Um, when we see positive associations, you know, relative risk, you know, 1.2, and you're like, well, maybe there's something there. It's low quality. What about when we see no association or negative associations? Can we speak a little bit more confidently to say that if there's no association, then probably there's no real association? Is, is, is there more? Are we, on a bit, are we on stronger ground when we talk about that? No, not particularly. The, uh, uh, you can have confounding going the other. You can have confounding going the other way. Um, it, we may uh, um, what you do about it may be different. Uh, if you see no association, you may say, "I'm not going to." Quite sensibly to me, 
I'm not going to worry about it until somebody's shown that, that at least there's a possibility, uh, there's at least some evidence that it does something bad. So um, you're not particularly on stronger grounds, but how you deal with it may differ. Do you have any, I mean, I guess I would ask you about some other topics that uh, you may have looked at the data or if you can comment. Like one of the recommendations is, you know, we, we've got to eat all this fiber in our diet. I don't eat any fiber. I'm doing fine. What is this? What is the, what is the quality of evidence on fiber? Or do you know, has that been evaluated? I, I am. Um, so I haven't had nutritionists as a particular interest of mine. Okay. So as I told you earlier, it's this guy who worked as my postdoc and I like him and he's a good guy and he's wanted me to continue to help him and he's interested in nutrition. So I'm helping him out. So now I know a lot about red meat, but I don't know anything about anything else. So that is uh, and until he does another guideline, he's going to do, I think he's thinking of doing one on fats. So some years down the line, I may know something about fats as well, but at the moment, with respect to nutrition, in terms of really knowing what I'm talking about, red meat is it. Okay, and and what what I mean outside of nutrition, because you're you're an internal medicine guy. I mean, do you have any thoughts on say cholesterol guidelines and, and things of that nature? I mean, what what other things that you are you are you aware of that you can say these are solid recommendations versus well, these are these are things that we well, um, uh, we we know. So in terms of what you eat, as I understand, so I don't know, um, as I just said, my knowledge is limited. However, my understanding, and you cited um, uh, Johnny Anitis, my understanding is that the red meat story is pretty well the standard story. In other words, as far as diet is concerned, um, we, have, we don't have anything that... Um, uh, isn't is other than low quality evidence. Um, as I say, I'm no expert, so if you find something, don't be surprised if you find something where there's higher quality evidence. But I, I think with confidence, I can say it's few and far between. Now, with respect to cholesterol, we do know that if you take statins, you are going to lower your risk of cardiovascular events, and at least part of that effect seems pretty clearly related to changes in your lipid status. So with respect to drugs, we're in a much better position. What other, uh, you know, are there things out there that people commonly believe are true uh, in, in either medicine or nutrition that the evidence is really not particularly compelling? I mean, I know one of the things we hear about is high protein is, is damaging the kidney, kidneys. And I've had Stu Phillips on the, on the show saying, look, we do a meta-analysis. It doesn't seem to hold up. I mean, do you, are there any things, anything else, things out there that might surprise people where the evidence is really not compelling that we, we sort, of, sort of believe? Um, well, um, I'll tell you about another guideline um, that we've just done where I chaired a guideline panel. Um, and it had to do with colon cancer screening. And... Um, the, uh, uh, the colon cancer screening does reduce colon cancer deaths. However, um, uh, particularly for low risk individuals, the effect is very small. And so what we ask, see, see how you would react. Um, if you're, if over 15 years, you could reduce your risk of colon cancer by one in a thousand, by going through screening, um, would you be interested? And we thought most people would not at that level of benefit. And then the question is, what benefit would they demand or require before they went through screening? And the screening guidelines up to now have not explicitly addressed that question. So they haven't come out and said, we think people would demand a five in a thousand, for instance, reduction in colon cancer mortality to undergo over 15 year period to undergo screening. And so some of the guidelines say everybody should start at 40 or everybody should start at 50 or everybody should start at 60. Starting at 40, they're implicitly saying people are ready to screen for very small benefits because the benefits go up as you get older. And those who start at 60 say, are saying implicitly, well, wait a minute, 
people would actually want a greater benefit to go through these screenings. But nobody prior to our work has said explicitly, here's what we think people would require to undergo screening and then make recommendations accordingly. So the guideline we did, we said, we may be wrong, but we think that to undergo the uh, stool testing, you would want a uh, benefit of five in a thousand over 15 years. And to undergo the invasive ones, colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy, you demand a benefit of 10 in a thousand. And uh, we don't know that that's the case. People haven't studied it. We looked at, people have done some studies of values and preferences, but they were limited, limited, limited. The information they gave was limited. So, um, and so our guideline looks different. It says, look at, there are risk calculators for getting your risk. And they can tell you if, if your risk comes up over 30 in a thousand, over the next 15 years, our guess is that the majority of people would say yes, screening. Under 30 to 1,000, the majority would say no. Under 30 to 1,000, some say yes, over 30, some say no. But in the, the, the point being that um, this is not a one size fits all. And when you said, well, what are misleading things, saying one size fits all does not actually make a lot of sense. And do we, I mean, I, I'm assuming we don't actually know those numbers that the, that the benefit is, whatever it might be, one in, one in, uh, one in a thousand. Or we have three. randomized trials. Yeah, we have randomized trials. We have, we have randomized trials for the stool screening and for sigmoidoscopy. The stool screening has improved, and we don't have randomized trials of the improved, but it, 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 they will be at least as good. They will be at least as good as the as the stool screening that was tested. And we don't have the randomized trials for colonoscopy. So, um, the, uh, and so we do what's called micro simulation studies based on the results of the randomized trials. So it isn't high confidence stuff, but a lot better than the meat. If you, uh, if you could design uh you know, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily a nutrition, but if you could design some studies, and I don't know if you, maybe you do, I don't know. Are you, does anybody does anybody come to you for study design? Like, look, I want to study. I want to do a study that's going to pass the muster, that's going to pass the grade classification. That's how I spend my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what kind of studies do we see that are that have been done that are that are that are that are actually high quality that are that are getting us somewhere? And, what, and where do we need to? Because there's a lot of money being spent in 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 research and in, in nutrition research, which has been my interest in the last few years. Where should we spend the money that we have in in doing doing data collection? Well, um, you know, that's uh, evidence based medicine has made a big fuss about values and preferences. And you're talking about value and preference decisions. Okay, so um, the, uh, so should we spend the, if it were up to me, we'd spend our money on things where we're gonna get clear answers. And we wouldn't do more nutrition studies where we're destined to end up well, maybe we've got some idea, but we really can't tell you without any assurance. Um, I would do studies, uh, I'd put my resources into randomized trials where we're going to end up, we're actually going to know something at the end. But somebody else may say, well, your randomized trials are in these restricted populations and they don't apply, whereas nutrition applies to everybody. And okay, well, maybe we won't get very, we only have low quality evidence, but when something applies to everything, low quality evidence is better than nothing. So um, it's a, so I would say these are value and preference decisions as to, because there would be different criteria. What is the, what's your, what's your notion of bang for the buck? So my notion of bang for the buck is at the end, we're really gonna know something. Somebody else's notion of bang for the buck may be it applies to the whole population. So even if we don't know as much, we should think of bang for the buck in terms of the extent of the population applies to. So these are value and preference sensitive decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, 
I, I see so many of these big epidemics. It seems like they keep constantly reviewing the NHANES data, the same data they look at, and they just kind of keep dicing and slicing it. And, and it's just like, why do they keep doing that? It, it kind of, it's kind of frustrating to see that all the time. Well, the reason they keep doing it is because um, there are people that because the, the reason, the Annals of Internal Medicine, one of these top journals, published six articles on the same topic on the same day. That is the first time they have ever done that. So we submitted our five systematic reviews and our guideline, and they published all six on the same day. Unheard of. Why? Because people are mad about nutrition. Everybody's interested in nutrition. And as a result, and the NHANES is probably as good a database as any, and everybody's interested in nutrition. So you keep going it and keep pumping out this stuff because there's a very high interest in nutrition. That's the reason they keep doing it. But does it, I mean, does I, wonder, you, I wonder if does it, it get you any fur, Does it get you any further ahead? <laughs> Perhaps not. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was wondering if there's any, any, any value in continuing to do that. It seems like we've made these hypotheses, you know, red meat causes colon cancer. How do we test it? And we're not doing that. And, and you know, it's, it's just, it, it becomes uh, a little bit frustrating, you know, because we yeah. just see this hypothesis but, generation. But, but, and, this is, and this is why the people would like to believe that the observational studies can give us things that we can actually be confident about, because it's also frustrating to recognize we may never have the answers. So I see you said earlier, John Ianita says we should go out and do the studies that will give us the answers. I'm not sure it's feasible to do the studies that are gonna give us the answers. This is where we may be stuck. We may be, this is the best it's gonna get, folks. Yeah, so we're left as, is, is it, if it tastes good, <laughs> go for it. You know, and, and I, cause I tell people, and you know, I say, I, I'm the same way I say, I don't think we, we can know from nutrition. And I say, you've got to just kind of pick your diet and see how it affects you. And if it affects you in a subjectively positive way, that's probably as good as we're going to get in, in my view. But I mean, maybe you would disagree with that. No, no. Uh, the, the only way I would disagree is um, uh, people, what you just said is absolutely right for individuals who say, if, if there's only low quality evidence of small effects, I'm not interested. Okay. Others may say, okay, low quality evidence, even small effects, I may be interested. I'd like to know about that before I make my decisions. So that would be the, that would be my only qualification of what you said. So if you were like, say your personal dietary choices and you, you've got all this evidence in front of you and you're looking at like, I'm going to read something that's going to make me decide to eat X or not eat X. How, what would you look at? You know, if, if I were, say, looking at the research, what's available, what you've seen that would, 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 would guide well, you that I, way? I, I'm the sort of guy who your advice was right for because um, I'm not going to base my choices on low-quality evidence of small effects. So I don't pay any attention to it. Um, uh, as I say, this is my only knowledge of the nutrition research is sort of what you can't help but see. Um, and, uh, and knowing things like what Johnny and Nittis writes. Um, um, so, so I'm the sort of guy who, uh, I have my own dietary peculiarity. I only eat one meal a day. I eat one meal a day in the evening. I don't eat any breakfast. I don't eat any lunch. I've been doing that for a long period of time. I don't eat any meat. Um, that's what makes me feel good. Um, so, so I'm, I'm the person who's not, who I'm not going to be swayed by low quality evidence of small effects. The, uh, so the, the, the six articles that you referenced that were posted in annals, you know, I think on October one, uh, there was a group, the physicians committee for responsible medicine that petitioned the FTC to have that removed. Do you have any, com <laughs> do you have any comments on that? I, I, I found it, I find it comic. Um, you know, sorry, this is not how science, this is not how anybody thinks, you know, they are just, when they do something like that, um, they are met, uh, uh, vividly demonstrating their ignorance of how science works. You know, you put things out 
and uh, you you uh, you say what are the strengths and weaknesses and so on and so forth. You don't you don't try to uh, blot it out from the from the literature. Yeah, and I think too, like when you have a landscape like we do with nutrition science, I think sometimes when scenarios like that do happen, if you pay attention to it, it can be good for your own personal usage because now you've identified a group who is clearly going to be stepping outside of 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 looking at the science and then you can use that as maybe like how much credibility you personally would put in something they're going to put out later down the road if you know that their biases are implemented right right so, that much. And so when somebody says uh, it, it, uh, it should all be pulled out as if it didn't exist um, that's a group never to listen to again as a smoking gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Great point. Professor Gott, are you still, what are you up to these days? Are you, do you have any other projects in the work? Are you, I mean, are you still, uh, I'm, 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 I'm still publishing about 50 papers a year. So, wow. The, uh, so I have, and, and um, I, I'm fortunate as I, uh, it's a bit of a joke or a bit, maybe a bit true. Um, I tell the, so I, I work with a v v wide variety of people who are junior to me, and uh, um, I'm very happy to help them on, unless I actually have to do some work myself, and, uh, <laughs> as long as anybody else is going to do the real work. So I help in planning the studies and in um, giving advice as the studies go along and in how to advice, how to analyze the results and how to interpret the results and so on. And that allows me to be involved with, I don't know, there are probably 10 investigative groups I'm involved in helping out with, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think it makes a lot of sense to, given your background, we're better off having you kind of essentially guide people to become more like you and ultimately have like a huge body of folks like that versus having you kind of do some of the stuff that maybe you would have done when you first started. That's exactly right. And, um, again, what you just described is exactly how I look at it. Um, let me add one other criticism that I'd like yeah, you to respond to. Just heads up, we've, uh, I think we've used up our hour. So okay. Well, okay. Yeah. We should end. Uh, uh, somebody's supposed to show up here for my next meeting. So That's sure. That's perfect. Professor, okay. we, we, we appreciate you coming on and thank you so much for your insight. Uh, we're, I'm, I know our audience is going to love this and I appreciate the opportunity. So, okay. Thank, well, thank you. Awesome. Take lots care. Of fun, lots of fun meeting you guys. Fun from my point of view. Perfect. Take care. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.